John says, I know I gave you 30 minutes, but can you do it in 20? I said, I'll talk to the Lord about it. <laughs> Romans 6, uh, beginning at the sixth verse, and I'm reading from the New International Version, reads, For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Jesus Christ. Therefore, do not let sin, sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness. And then skip to verse 18. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. For the few minutes that I have with you, let me just uh, share from what I'll call um, a working theme, liberated to do the gospel. Liberated to do the gospel. Now, I believe it's very common for people of different faith traditions to brag on their tradition. Um, everybody likes to believe that their culture or their faith uh, is it, and that uh, they have a unique revelation from God that no one else has gotten, and when others get it, everything will be perfect. In other words, when they get what we got, the world will work the way the world is supposed to work, and I believe that we as believers as followers of Jesus Christ are no different. Jews, for example, we like to say, quietly of course, they may be the chosen people, but they're still looking for a Messiah, but we have found the Messiah and his name is Jesus. We kind of like to brag about the fact that we have found what others are looking for. Muslims. You know, they pray five times a day, they fast consistently, they read the Quran and the Bible, by the way, religiously. But we say, but their leader, Muhammad, died, was buried, and we can find his grave. But the grave of Jesus is empty because he's alive in you and me. We like to brag on what we think is a superior faith a superior belief. When we say that a little bit about other faiths as well, Buddhists, Hinduists, Taoists, Confucianists, New Age people, that they're looking for what we got. And in a real way, what we're saying is just, is that Jesus is the answer that the world is looking for. Well, I want to challenge that tonight. I want to challenge us to think about that tonight. That because there are a number of events that, that I believe have, have been rocking this nation uh, and have caught us unaware and that we in a way as a people have not come to grips with what it means for Jesus to be the answer in this time and in this day. I won't even talk about the election and the fraud that's been so rampant that, that black people who've been disenfranchised for years and years are trying to get their vote know about that the rest of the world is understand. I won't even talk about the election. I won't talk about that. 
But I want to talk about five or six other trends that I don't think we have dealt with as a people. One, we have not dealt with suburban school violence that, that shatters the myth that money is it, that money is a, it just settles all scores. We have not yet dealt as a, as a Christ-centered people with racial profiling, which means that, that, that anyone in this room, John Perkins, or your, the person seated next to you who might be African-American walking out or driving outside, can be arrested for simply driving while black in these United States. We have not dealt with the growing, what is called now, prison industrial complex that is, that is, the, grow, is the largest growing business in America. That, that black and brown young men are, are being housed in greater numbers than in schools and in colleges and in universities. We, we have, as a body of Christ, among European Christians, among white Christians, been deafening in our silence about the appeal by black Americans for a formal apology for 400 years of slavery and its lingering impact. We've been, we have not dealt with that. We, we have not dealt as well with the fact that rap music is not just the language of ghetto kids, it is seeping through universities, children of white Americans in suburbia and in rural young people and around the world. This language of rage, this language that, that won't go away, sometimes vulgar, sometimes violent, sometimes anti-female, but, but speaking about a pain that, that defies our imagination. And then finally, we have not dealt with the lingering effects of centuries of atrocities against our Native American brothers and sisters. We have not dealt with those issues. And let me suggest tonight, if we're going to talk about reconciliation, these issues cannot be dealt with in the old way. You know what the old way is. It is, it is it's kind of a quick fix. Nobody's, nobody's at fault. Um, Grab hands, sing we shall overcome, put a few of these and put a few of those in the same room and call it reconciliation, go home, that's it, we've done it. These issues are not going away because I believe that they force us tonight to examine what it means to be in bondage to the sin of greed, of materialism, of power, of, and of tradition, of racism, of sexism. We have not yet come to grips with that. that. That either, as Paul said in the reading, that we're gonna be in bondage to sin or to God. I believe that it was one writer who said, you're gonna serve somebody. You're gonna serve either the devil or the Lord. You're gonna serve somebody. So the issue is, what, what is Paul saying to us about this? What, what can Paul tell us? What is his credentials to tell us anything tonight? Uh, I, I ask that question that way because here is a man who himself was bad news trying to talk about the good news. Bad news to Christians. Serial killer. Boasted about, bragged about killing believers and presenting it as, as a score of victory. But here is Paul in the book of Romans telling us about what the essence is of what it means to be liberated to serve God. And he puts it simply this way. He says to Jewish Christians who thought they cornered the market on what it means to be a believer, he says, let me tell you this. He says, all humanity is born in sin, rebelling, rebellious against God, enemies to God, hateful of God, a proclivity to sin. He says not only that, is that sin is not about doing anything sinful, it's doing being sinful. It's about being likely to sin 
than likely to follow God. He says, but the good news is that God in his mercy, God in his grace, God has made provision for us to be set free, to be totally free, not only of sin, but the bondage of sin, of the control of sin. He says the good news further is that, that this sin that separates us from God is no longer our master, that we in fact have a choice. We are not puppets. God didn't make puppets, but he gave us the free will to decide to choose life in God or death in sin. And he says that the issue for your freedom is, is not that you share this gospel, you sing this gospel, you teach this gospel, you dance this gospel, you worship and you praise in this gospel, and you disciple people in this gospel. He says the issue in freedom is to be the gospel, be the good news, be the story that people need, be the difference, be the answer, be it by doing it. Now, now this is really hard for us to take because I thought that when I accepted Christ, as Lord and Savior of my life 20 years ago, that that was it. That, that God had run me down, he chased me down, and, and I surrendered. And my life changed. And, and basically, that, that, was, that was it. I, I, I really had done all I was going to do uh, on surrender. I, I was going to be as nice as I could to white people, but that's as much as I could, God could expect of me to be nice. Love was something else. I'd be as nice as I could to Republicans, but that's about as best I can do. That's something else. This surrender thing can get you in a whole lot of trouble. But Paul is saying to Jews then, and he's saying to us tonight, quit giving people the impression that if they follow a bunch of rules and regulation, they will qualify for your Jesus. He says in Romans 12, present your body as a living sacrifice. Just show up. In other words, there's power in just being present with unholy people. It's power in show. In fact, I think that we ought to be, we ought to be the ones who are showing up and people ought to be afraid we're going to show up. It's the other way around. I have Muslim friends and people ask me, what am I doing with Muslim? I think that I am doing the gospel. I think that they ought to watch out because they're going to be around me a little bit while they're going to be singing this little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. Why would I be afraid to be with Jews or Muslims or Hindus or New Age people? But I don't need to give them a lot of rules and regulations. I need to just simply tell them what was told to me, that Jesus loves me, that Jesus died for me, that the price was already paid, that I don't have to fill out an application. Paul says to Jews, quit talking about circumcision and just talking about your church. Just go be the church on your job in your school, in your business. Quit judging people and talking about what they don't have that you have. And quit bragging about what you have. Much of our energy, I suggest to you in the body, is bragging. You know, my ministry used to be very small, but since Jesus blessed me, you know, my, uh, my new book is coming out, and now um, I'm, my book is going to be featured alongside Tony Evans and, and uh, you know, and, and John Perkins. My church, my ministry, I mean, I'll bet I spend more time with the poor than you do. I bet I mentored more inner city kids than you have. In other words, We've spent a lot of time bragging, but Jesus is basically saying, and Paul is saying, if you want to brag up on anything, brag about how free you are in Christ. Brag about, boast about how God has delivered you and set you free. 
brag about the fact that you can be anywhere, anytime, any place with anyone because you have the power that they need. Brag about that. And realize that you have nothing. You own nothing. You brought nothing, and you will take nothing away. So Paul is saying to us, the same freedom that the Jews felt that they exclusively had, he said, let me tell you what, what you really have as Jews. He says, yes, you have been selected by God to be a chosen people. Chosen in the sense that God chose to send the liberator through you. But he says, after that, it's all even. You have no more right in, or access to God than the least person out there in the street. Everyone, because of the blood of Jesus, has the same access to God. What right do I have to boast about non-believers or about my, my power in God? So he says to me, if you want to boast, then take your save and sanctified self, Barbara, out where the poor are exploited. Don't, don't just do a little thing. He says, don't, don't just go and do the least thing and say that that's serving God. He said, but what we're dealing with here is what Jesus confronted is a system that exploits, a system that is racist, a system that blocks the powerless. Go and be God to them. Go and be Christ to them. If you want to be really boastful and braggadocious, go and say to Jew, to one Jewish person, I'm sorry for the Holocaust. Say to one Native American, I'm sorry for the reservation. Say to one black person, I'm sorry about slavery. Say to one white woman on welfare, I'm sorry that we worked on kicking you off so that we could brag about how few people are on welfare, but we didn't provide training for you. We didn't provide daycare for you. I'm sorry to people in Appalachia who are white and poor. In other words, God is looking for some evidence of our faith. And without the evidence, I may not be liked by this statement, but we are no different from Jews from Buddhists, from Hindus, from Muslims, apart from our faith in Christ and our action in light of our faith. What is there to brag about? To be a follower of Jesus Christ is just that. Where, where are we following Jesus? Are we following him among the gang leaders? Or are we afraid? and hovering in our comfortable pads in fear? Are we following them among where teenage girls are hanging out in the malls, who are white and from the suburbs and who are lost and who are snorting a little bit? Are we following them to where the elderly have been forgotten? In other words, what is it that commends our faith except that we act on it? Isaiah put it this way. He said, when he came into the temple, he said, in the year, that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. And I said, holy, holy, holy is he. But he didn't say holy, holy, holy until King Uzziah died. In other words, some King Uzziahs need to die in our lives for us to see the holiness of God and the holiness in which God has made us in Jesus Christ. God is trying to do something special in us and cannot do that something special until something dies in us. There is something wrong in a country where 40% of our nation is still children who are poor. Where are believers on that? Where are we likely to deal with the issue again of slavery which is not going away? You don't need to apologize to me you don't need to apologize to Oprah, but you need to apologize to somebody who doesn't look like he was black. Because the Bible makes it very clear that apart from our repentance that brings about forgiveness, that brings about healing, there can be no reconciliation. Reconciliation presupposes repentance. And let me turn it around so that you don't think I'm beating up on white folks tonight. Where are the black
black folks who are willing to take the nearest white person by the hand and say, I will not hold you hostage anymore. I am your brother and I am your sister. Let's walk together from this point on. I challenge you on that. I challenge you at some point to get past your fear, to come and even give it to God. I, I want us tonight to deal with the issue of fear. Because it's, it's only fear, I believe, that keeps us from acting in obedience to Christ. And let me just suggest to you that, that, that I too have that. I have that fear. I had that fear when, when a few months ago I was, I was actually challenged by God about some killings that was going on in a local high school in Washington, D.C., that, that I should be there in some way. And I, I thought, well, what can I do? What can one person do? Um, there are African-American kids today who don't remember Martin Luther King. They, they don't know who Fannie Lou Hamer is. They sure don't know who I am. And don't get all that excited about you showing up. What could I do? Nine children killed last year. Police car outside the school all the time. What could I do? Well, I, I thought about it and I prayed and I prayed and I prayed about it. And the word of God came to me that you take, that, that you take yourself, you present your body, first of all. And then God says, you present your body and then I'll tell you the rest. Well, what, I, what God showed me is that we have the teaching that our young people need. So I took all of Tom's leadership material and all of mine over the years, and I got a, a high school group together and asked them to show me how to translate basic character education into language that they would love, that they could relate to. And as of this September, we have been teaching character education through Christian teachers who we train and raise money for every single day. And not one kid has been killed in that same school in the last three months. Not one child. Because we patrol the hallways. The children see us. They know us. They know we're there. Was I scared in the beginning? Yes, I was. They look like me and I look like them. But it's a scary situation. But I said, if I don't go, then who could I blame for the next child? The prison industrial complex is going to keep growing until you and I deal with three-year-olds and four-year-olds. Some of you are retired and could have your home as an after-school safe haven for young people. You could have an opportunity to talk to young people, to share with them. The reason they're getting sex education from each other is because we're not around. And we're sanctified, locked up in our churches, and yet something about an adult being around a young person, not just any adult, a loving adult, a non-judgmental adult, a caring adult who shows up over and over and over, and guess what's happening? The young men are taking their hats off. The girls are wearing full clothes. They got everything covered up at school. They're saying yes ma'am and no ma'am, but more than that, they're staying after school to do homework. The other teachers who are not believers, by the way, there are 100 teachers in the school, and about, we've identified about 25 who are believers, have begun meeting at each other's homes to pray for the work. I am suggesting to you that the world is not ready for believers who show up free in Jesus. Not ready for us. But, but, but are waiting and hoping and praying that we don't show up. We really are like the children of Israel. You remember that story, I love it because it, 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 it's me, it's me again. The children of Israel, led by Joshua and Caleb, running into the house of a prostitute named Raham, running from the king's army, and having to hear from a prostitute exactly what their mission was. She said, we know that God has already given you this land. And everybody is afraid for you because we heard 
about how God padded the soles of your shoes and you're in the water did not give out and the food did not give out in the desert because of your God. She said, don't just remember me when your God shows up. When you come into the land, remember me. In other words, the children of Israel were afraid to go and do God's work and the non-believers were afraid that they would show up. That's us. So I want to suggest to you from the life of Paul and from Paul's word to us in the Romans, to, from Romans to count ourselves to be free from sin and alive in Christ and that we have been set free. He says that there are four things that I had to learn in order for me to exercise my freedom in Christ. He said that, that first of all, I had to get off my high horse. That's the first thing I had to do. Paul, as you remember, on the road to Damascus on another killing spree gets knocked off his horse. Many of us need to get off our horse. See, our horse is our ministry. Our horse is the titles and the labels we have. Our horse are the things that we've amassed. Oh, we don't have a lot of money, but we have a lot of titles and positions. Our horse, we need to, let, we need to get off our horse. Because once he got off his horse, the first thing he said is, he, he acknowledged God. I believe that until I can say that this is not, I don't have a ministry. Every single day I wake up and I thank God that he's even allowed such as me to work with God. That, that God would even consider me a value. God doesn't need me and God does not need you. But God has allowed us to be co-laborers with God in this work called soul winning. Get off your horse. Secondly, Paul had to get personally connected to people he couldn't even stand. Now, this is the closest most of us are going to be ever to worshiping with people who don't look like us. This is not my church on Sunday. How many of you have a, this is not your church on Sunday? It's not, this is not. Come on, God is watching. Give it up. Give it up. But wouldn't it be awesome? Wouldn't it be incredible? Did we not have our hearts touched by this choir and by this teaching? And aren't we robbed by not being able to hear from one another? That, that your pain is no less than my pain? story is no less valuable than my story and you don't have a white story and I have a black story we have a human story and we got to tell it to each other we got to hear each other's stories thirdly he says you got to realize that you've been liberated to do the gospel not not to wait on the good news to preach it occasionally, to teach it. But he said, you got to do it. Doing it serving the poor. Doing it reaching out to people who you are afraid of. Do it with people who have the power that you want. Do it as a white person experiencing some unearned skin privilege. And at a time you know we need to be talking about real equality. Do it. Do it without reservation. Do it because the price has been paid. Do it because Christ already did it in and for you. Maybe what we need in CCDA are some workshops on, on, on how, to, how, how to be the people of God. Maybe we need to role play what it means to, to leave our church one Sunday and walk into a church of people who we don't even know so we can experience together the fear of not knowing whether we'll be accepted. Maybe we can experience together what white people feel when they're the only person in a room full of African Americans as we have always experienced. Maybe we need to say what that feels like, but together. Maybe we need to listen to models like John Perkins and, 
and Wayne Gordon and asked them, how did you continue in this relationship that's mutually respectful, where John does not lord it over Wayne and Wayne over J John? Their backgrounds are different, but there's something special. Where did they start? Did Wayne have to check himself so he didn't become the, the aggressive, in-charge white man all the time? Because John is like that anyway, and he's black. You know, you know what I mean, that, that, that maybe we can learn something from one another. Maybe we have something to teach each other. And finally, we need, the fourth thing we've learned from Paul is that we've got to acknowledge that following Christ is scary. It's risky business. It's lonely business. You will not get awards for this. It is life-threatening even. Paul says, I die daily. He says, I, my life's been threatened. I've been beaten within an inch of my life. They had to lower me down the side of a, a building to keep me from being beaten. But he said, to live is God. And die is even better. To live is gain. To die is even better. And until we get to the point where our, we count ourselves dead, to righteousness. We won't say, here am I, Lord, send me. We need to sing like David tonight. Create in me a clean heart, oh God. Why? Because salvation happened when you said yes to Lord, yes, Jesus, come into my heart, but every day you think about things you shouldn't be thinking about. Every day you are tempted. Every day you feel jealous. Every day you have the, the likelihood of saying something unkind. So every day you've got to stand up like David. And I made this my theme song every morning. Create in me a clean heart, oh God. Renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not, oh Lord from your presence or remove your Holy Spirit from my life. He says, restore to me the joy of your salvation. Salvation isn't something we own. It's a gift from God. And he says, plant a willing spirit within me. Create in me a clean heart this day. This morning, we need to wake up and each morning and say, God, what do you want me to do with these 24 hours? Who do you want me to see? Who do you want me to minister to? Where do you want me to go? Who can I love today? God, I've got 168 hours this week. Where should I be with it? What should I do different? How can I break out this mold of having my day timer set for five years and no matter what God says, I'm going to do what's in my day timer. And let God wait like the rest of the world. But if we would just wake up and say, God, I've got 168 hours this week and they're your hours because you gave me the breath to wake up. Tell me what you want me to do, where you want me to go. Who do you want me to minister to? Who do you want me to love today? Who do you want me to forgive today? Who do you want me to teach today? Who should I sing to? Who should I dance with as David danced? Who can I be enslaved to your righteousness with? Who can I tell my story to today and this week? I believe that the people of God I have not seen yet the nation free because we are not free. But when we begin to ask ourselves, what will it cost me to obey God? Okay, I, I know what that is. It costs me fear, it costs me courage, it'll cost me friendships, it'll cost me money, it'll cost me time. But what if we ask the second question? What will it cost me if I don't do it? What will it cost? Because the price has already been paid. 
What will it cost my children, my family? What will it cost my church? What will it cost this nation? Because you re remember, you are one person, but one person matters. One person plus Jesus is a majority. Let's pray. Lord God Almighty, we just praise you. We thank you. We worship you. We adore you. God, we lift up our minds to you. God, we surrender to you our lives. God, we surrender our thoughts, our hearts, our very agendas to you. God, we give you our calendars, our checkbooks, our time. Lord, we've never done this before, but we want to do it tonight, God, because our nation is crumbling and we have the only answer. Create in us a clean heart. Oh, God, help us to know that we are already reconciled to you and to one another. And now we've been liberated to just go and be the good news to one another and to the unbelieving world. Amen.